What's up? It's Tommy Green. You're listening to the Rev Talks podcast brought to you by the Rev Gatherings, digital tribe of up-and-comers, emerging leaders, <laughs> doing our best to keep in step as the face of the church changes in our generation. If this is your first time checking out the podcast, welcome home. If you are a returning visitor, hiya. Feel free to subscribe, share it around, give us a five-star review. Tell somebody. If you like what you hear, please let us know. You can reach out to us at therevgatherings.com. Feel free to email us at therevgatherings at gmail.com. Hope you enjoy the episode. See you on the other side. Mr. Garrett, I love you. Yes. So welcome to the Rev Talks podcast officially. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, bro. Come on. Okay, so catch me up a little bit on um, maybe like 2019 as a whole. What were some of the like kind of highlights for you personally? What were some of the like maybe good, bad, and indifferent? What did you kind of – how was that? How was last year for you? Um, I thought it was <laughs> – I thought it was a good year for me, and, and then all of a sudden it wasn't, you know, and uh, I guess that's how it can go. Um, I uh, was, you know, I kind of experienced a lot of growth and, and being creative and we were traveling a lot. And then um, I had like a pretty serious mental breakdown uh, when we were in Europe at the end of November. And we were two shows into this like 35 show tour in Europe where we were like supporting a band and we're on a bus and stuff. And then I uh, broke down and uh, actually tried to kill myself and got like arrested sort of by the Belgian police and thrown in a mental hospital. And then I like kind of snuck out of the mental hospital, which is insane and caught a flight to America. And then, you know, admitted myself into a 30 day treatment, which was exactly December 30th, sorry, December 1st to December 30th. Um, so yeah, I was in as Chris. I think for Christmas, I was in like a mental. Uh, it was like a clinic. It wasn't really a hospital. It was it was it was less creepy than the Belgium mental hospital. Uh, and this was in Florida, and it was I was at a clinic uh, for like mental health. And some of the people there were like uh, like there for like some pretty like gnarly serious mental stuff. And some people there were there there for addiction. Some people were there because you know, they cheated on their spouse or their spouse cheated on them. So like, there, there's a variety of things. And there's some other people who similar to me had like attempted recently and stuff. Um, and so I was there for 30 days, including Christmas. And then I got out and I, I've just kind of been like figuring it out since then. So, yeah. That's so heavy. That's so, okay. Wait a minute. So, um, ta- I, I'm really, I'm like, I was going to, I was going to tell you about, and I think probably this will be a really, I mean, if you're it, I know how much love you have in your heart and I know how much I love you. So I feel like this can be a pretty cool, even connection personally, but, um, I ended up going, I'm trying to think, I ended up like in November going out and for the, for the past handful of years, um, probably since about 2013, right, right before for people that would even care the timeline of the band it was like before we put out the finished people record like right at that time there was like seven kind of personal cataclysmic sort of events and i feel like on the inside my temperature gauge was like it should be at 78 (laughs) like running and i've been running like reactive and and fight or flight like real bad for years like i have not felt very good at all And so I ended up going to do some like trauma therapy in November. This is different. And I I had no idea, Gary, I don't, so you, your background is pretty, you have a lot of understanding into mental health, into trying to help people. It's a passion. It's something that you've given yourself to. So the fact that um, your humanity is showing so profoundly and beautifully in this conversation, can you talk about like what what you thought of you, what you were thinking, 
and kind of give a background to like wh why I'm even bringing this up. What was your job? Like, what was your degree in? What did you study? And then yeah, um, about that from that perspective is interesting because I feel like a lot of people would view you in certain ways as like someone that's really put a lot of time into understanding some of these issues. But yeah, I, 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 I've always worked. Like I, so ever since I was a kid, I kind of always knew that I wanted to like understand the mind and psychology stuff mm -hmm. more. And so I, um, I, uh, I, you know, did, I got my undergrad degree in English and philosophy because they were like the two most fun majors, easiest to. Um, and yeah. then I. Uh, oh, I think you I think you muted yourself. Unmute. There okay, you go. Cool. Uh, yeah. So English, those were the funnest, and you. Yeah, those were the fun ones, and and then yeah. I went to grad school for uh, for psychology. It, it was a PhD program that was um, the goal was to to become a psychologist, you know, become a doctor. And um, wow. I uh, I however um, the band started to uh, gain momentum enough to where uh, so when you took us on tour in 2013, I was halfway through my master's degree. And that, that was our first, no, sorry, that was our second, like, uh, national tour. And that was our first actually truly national tour because the previous one was just like a regional thing. So this was the first time we ever did a circle of America was with you guys uh, in 2013. Okay, okay. And so I was halfway through my master's degree. We finished that tour. I go back to school for a whole nother year. And then I got my master's degree. And during that year I was getting my master's, I was a, th I was a therapist at a university counseling center. Wow. And so I, I would like... It was great because I'd work like I was like overseen, which meant basically I would have one on one therapy with like 10 students over the course of the week. And then I'd report back to a doctor, you know, once a week and say, hey, you know, this is what's happening. Then they'd give me advice. So it's, it's, it's kind of the best of both worlds where you get the autonomy to like work with people one on one. But then you also get to talk to someone who like knows way more than you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, I think, honestly, is how all life should be. There should always be some accountability. And some, some <laughs> there should, there should be a profound upward grace of some yeah. kind above you helping. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, profound <laughs> upward grace. And so, I, I, I love that, and I love doing that. But I also really knew that the band, you know, was something that I should pursue. So, since 2014, when I got my master's degree, and I actually skipped the ceremony because I like we were starting a tour. But uh, since 2014. Um, Oh, no, you know, what? I'm sorry. 2014 is when you took us on the Finnish people tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so the, sorry, that was, I, that's right. I, that, that's why I didn't go to my ceremony. Cause we were like heading out to start the Finnish people. That's right. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways. Um, so since 2014, I've been doing the tour thing and kind of functionally homeless, so to speak. Like I haven't lived in any one set place for six years now. Um, because California is so expensive. Yes. <laughs> so like yeah. I, I've just realized like it's makes so much more sense to like get home from tours and like just crash with friends for a couple of months. But cause like, you know, how, I mean, you remember how it is you're on tour for like eight months out of the year. It's like, dude, I'm not going to pay, you know, three, $1,300 in rent for a place that I'm using like a third of the time. I mean, you, you understand real estate. That's just not, that's just not valuable investment of your money. So, wow. So I've been doing that for a long time, but um, I've been having, especially since like 2018, like anxiety has just been building and building and building. And uh, I wasn't really aware of it. I just kind of thought, man, you know, like life's getting harder and harder. And I didn't really realize it until it all, the ground kind of fell out from underneath me. Wow. I didn't really realize that like, holy shit, like that's a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, yeah. I, I kind of knew the depression was there, but I didn't know the anxiety was there. Like, like I, looking back at it, it's like it was staring me in the face, but I, I just, whenever I thought of anxiety, I guess I thought of like agoraphobic people that, you know, can't leave their homes. And yeah. I guess I just always thought, well, yeah, that's not me. I'm not anxious. It's just, you know, whatever. And it turns out I was like incredibly anxious, like super to the point where, um, fun, fun fact, I think I was probably complaining about it when I saw you. Yeah. When we were on the August Madrid tour that you came out to the show yeah. in, in Salt Lake, my acid reflux was so bad on that tour that I was like sleeping two hours a night and like eating like weird foods. And like, like my life was like controlled by acid reflux, right? It was like awful. And it's so funny because now I just know that, dude, I mean, that shit, that, that was my anxiety. Like, 
Because the moment I got treatment for anxiety, which involved taking uh, gabapentin three times a week, or sorry, sorry, three times a day, um, 300 milligrams. Like, I was like, oh, like one, well, all of a sudden one day when I was at the mental clinic, I was like, that's weird. Like, I'm not in pain after eating. And then I went to bed, I woke up, I'm like, that's weird. There's not acid reflux in my mouth. Then like, and I realized like, oh my God, like my anxiety was so bad that my body was just literally just shooting acid up. Whoa. And it's so funny how the body was like screaming at me like, hey, dude, like we're, we're, we're lo- you're losing it. But I just like kept thinking, man, I have bad acid reflux. This is so stupid. I never thought like maybe it has to do with, you know, my mental state. So it goes to show you, you know, I, I, I could have a, I had a, an okay understanding of mental health and, you know, diagnoses and stuff, but I was still very, very blind to my situation. Okay, so it's, if you can, I mean, if you have enough sort of maybe capacity of distance for it, talk a little bit about like for people that are struggling too, that would that they need permission to know that like, huh, maybe, maybe let me do it. Let me get like a second opinion on myself real quick. I feel like that holy crap, am I actually struggling? Like, when did the, when did the ground start falling out from underneath you? Like, when were you like, oh my God. And then why do you think, or if you, if you can tell me what, why, why suicide? Why? Like, I'm, I gotta stop this or I'm out or why there? Yeah. No, no, totally. I mean, to the why suicide, I think, um, I had like gotten really deep into all or nothing thinking, you know, like either something was great, something was bad. And I was, I was living in this binary reality where I was just creating all these false dichotomies all the time. And so part of it, because obviously suicides, I think the most extreme uh, thing that you could do in a reaction to a situation. Um, and so for me, it was kind of like, well, it's either going to get better or it's not. And then I just had some personal stuff get way worse. And so I said, okay, well, everything's going to get worse. And my anxiety kind of, because like, I, I, I'd been like feeling, it sounds crazy, but I've been feeling the world getting darker. Like, it, like, and I know that, I mean, a lot of Christians obviously are always into, you know, like, oh, the world's getting darker and, and stuff. And, and I think that can be true. But for me, it was like, like it was pretty severe to where like I was looking back at things that I used to like to do a couple of years ago and I just had no interest in those things. And I just had felt like I was reaching like, like almost like my life had climaxed sometime in like 2017. And that like, I, I just had this like, like I'm like, I'm going like going downhill and, and oh. not, not in a reasonable, not like, oh, you know, I'm getting older. I can't jump as high as I used to. No, it was like, it was like everything is falling apart super quickly and like I was just like like getting to where I could like like I couldn't read anymore I know it sounds crazy but my anxiety was so bad that like I would read like maybe two or three sentences in a book and then I'd have to set the book down and go do something else and and it it was was putting me on this hamster wheel where I would be like I'd be like okay I'm gonna go do that and then I'd do that for like five seconds and then get freaked out and have to do something else And like, it was making me super unproductive, which was worsening it because I'm like, I can't even do anything anymore. And so I think when a few things happened wrong for me in Europe, including like my, um, my, my voice was getting really screwed up. um, I just kind of got to this place. I was like, I just, I I really had convinced myself like, dude, this is it. Like, like, like my, the, the hamster wheel was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it was just like you can't even move anymore just you're just that's it like I, and I was at the end of my rope and I said you know fuck it and, and so I said I'm gonna jump out of this bus while it's moving um and I might not kill me it might but regardless like I just felt like so all or, all or nothing that I had to do the most ridiculous things you know um because and, and it blows my mind because I look at it now and it's like I feel like I was a different person completely you know, and and maybe on the outside, I look the same. And I think that I was behaving the same towards people. Like, I I don't think my friends, you know, ever thought like, dude, are you on drugs? Like, I think I could handle it. But my internal reality was a very different person. Yeah, crazy. But, um, you know, I, I know that you know a lot about 
like dealing with loss and 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 how that loss can like really really change your your view of reality you know and yeah. like um I, I guess I was dealing with some losses that I hadn't even identified, you know, like, and, and just stuff that I'd kind of put on the back burner. And so I just, yeah, I, I don't know. So anyways, I'm sorry. Cause I, no, I don't, I don't know what the shape this podcast is supposed to be. No, taking. Oh, this is it. It's I literally like, I'm, I'm like so remarkably honored that you are sharing because I just wonder, like y- you, you said a second ago, like my friends weren't necessarily super hard. Like maybe I seemed maybe off or more off than normal. Yeah. 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 Tour, tour life. Maybe he's having a rough tour, but like inside you were in a totally different place. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't think that any of my loved ones knew that like I had gone to like the outdoor store recently to like, look at getting a deposit on a gun. You know I mean? I was like really just, uh, yeah. I mean, just anxiety, anxiety basically made my, experience of living like so hellish that um that my and 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 then also made it unable for me to function and my self-worth got super low in depression that I just I just was like you know there's no way that this gets any better and I'm like unable to do any of the things that I love I can't enjoy the things I love anymore and not to mention like I feel like this is just like it's it's almost like even when you have a nightmare and you're like you try to wake yourself up because you're like oh this is gonna get worse, and yeah. you, like you're aware it's gonna get worse. And so I kind of felt like that about my entire life. I was like this is this whole thing's gonna get so much worse that like if I can do anything I can to just stop it, I I need to do that. You know? Is that like a fa- let me ask you this for people that are that if they hear you and they're like oh my god that's me mm, yeah before they continue to do too intense dichotomies, they're like ideation is out the window. What what could have, what would, what would you recommend? Would you have stopped and said something? Were you even aware? Did you need medication? Did you just need to a break? Did you need to like, as opposed to attempting to end your life, did you need to just like do something drastic that was going to like shake you? What, what is this? Cause I've not been there. I've not been where you are in that way. You know, mine was more mm-hmm. guilt. It was, it was connected more to like making a mistake and not, not having a redemptive lens to make anything better. That was a different deal. That was like yeah. overwhelmed with guilt. Yours, it sounds like you had more, you're more cognizant of what's going on. So some kid is hearing us. I'm not an expert, but like, what should, ha- if you could like throw red flags in the air and go, yeah. Hey, before I jump off this bus, I I would have can you even, can you do that? Yeah. No, so there's a few things that I wish that like, that, that I would have told my, uh, myself. One is that like, it's okay to fail because a lot of my anxieties were wrapped up in just my fears of failing. Like, like I was so afraid of, and you might understand this. Uh, I was so afraid of losing my voice on tour. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because my, my band is like finally like in the last like six months kind of hit this like cool spurt of growth. Yeah. And so like, I've been like, well, what's the only thing that can screw it up? And I'm like, well, probably my voice, you know, like, like going out. Your body is the instrument. It's not like exactly. you go out, exactly. the whole show is like totally exactly. compromised. Totally. Yep. Exactly. And so I, um, so like, I was so afraid of that happening that I, like, I was unknowingly, my brain was sabotaging my health. And so one, I, w- I would say like, First of all, understand the mind body connection is so much more profound than you than, like, because we grew up with this like Western, me, you know, medical standpoint of like, oh, yeah, like, you, like, like you're sad, go, go to the psychologist. Oh, you feel like sick, go to the doctor. And I wasn't understanding that my mind was making me sick for the most part. Holy and so like, <laughs> like, like understanding that. And it's funny because, you know, holistic medicine, doctor people, they get so much crap and maybe some of it's deserved, but a lot of it is just because holistic people are saying like, dude, it's all one. Yeah, <laughs> like, we're all connected. If we treat the so whole connected. thing. Huh? And so first of all, would be like looking at my, my, my outlook in reality and my health and saying, how much of that has to do with the brain? Probably a lot of it. And yeah. so first of all that. Second of all, I knew that I was, I knew that I was mentally not well, but I was so like, dude, 
you know, excuse my language, but fuck psychopharmacology. Like I was so afraid wow. of, of taking medication for my mind. And like, like, and like, it's funny because I never said that out loud. Like, I mean, I would talk to kids at shows all the time that are like, yo, you know, I'm seeing this doctor and they gave me some meds. Like, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, I, I, maybe you should listen to the doctor, man. Yeah. But like, I wasn't practicing inside, what I did. You were, no. you had a, you had a no. Inside, inside I had a huge bias against, against taking, you know, meds and, um, wow. and these med these meds have helped me a lot. Um, smokes. Cause like the, the, the one thing that I, like when I knew they were helping me, cause a lot of times you can take a med and say, wait, am I just happy because of this? Or am I happy because I had a good day? Sure. But the one thing that changed for me so dramatically with um, this is I, I used to wake up with my heart racing all the time. Boom, 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 boom. And when I started taking these, I would wake up and I would just feel normal again. Like I would feel like you're supposed to feel when you wake up, you know, I'd feel kind of tired. I'd feel kind of groggy, but I, I, I stopped feeling this like fight or flight thing kick on the moment I woke up. Holy and, smokes. Um, so that's helped me a lot. And then I think the third thing has been, um, which to be fair, wasn't really that, possible for me um before i got help but i think the other thing has been now that i am like calming down to to stop myself from doing that again is like practicing like being still like praying but not in a way of like just talking but just trying to listen mm -hmm. and like and, and like meditating and breathing and all that stuff that just slows you down and yeah. makes you stop thinking like I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so, because I think, and unless if I address those things, I think I'll probably go off the cliff again, you know. What you're talking like sort of anxiety driven, consuming media, staring at your screen all the time, like oh, totally. just trying to, trying to somehow turn off without actually taking the initiative to kind of like turn off, like give yourself some sp space and some peace. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're coming out of, uh, with a song exactly a week from now. And I wrote the lyrics when I was in the mental hospital. And then I recorded them the day I got out. And uh, the whole song is basically about me being a machine, like screaming, like trying to become a human again, you know. Uh, wow. And the, the songs kind of comes from a dark place. But then uh, the, the chorus is kind of like the sort of call to action. And I have, you know, I have Thomas and, and the chorus singing. Um, um, now I know it's delusion in love with the slow demise. And then he says, be still and human, be still and be consumed, you know, Come on. like that's, mm -hmm. that's where, like, that's where the, the change has to happen is in like the still quiet places. But like, I couldn't be still because my inability to be still prior led to this massive anxiety disorder. But now thanks to therapy and some medications, I can be still again. And, and work on not getting to that place again, wow. you know. <sighs> yeah, so that that's kind of that's kind of where it's at right now. It's so it's really powerful. First off, let me say that I love you, and I'm so glad you're still alive. I love you too, man. And I'm really it really makes I have like fear and sad like that you were there and i'm like oh my god so i i think just i'm i'm grateful because i feel like hey like maybe even in this conversation and i you know it's it's me so i don't know i don't know who might ever hear this but if we had the opportunity to help intervene and someone's kind of like they're in their own cycle and they, they aren't going to realize it until something changes. I just don't want that change to be so dramatic that it ends their life. So yeah, like, no, if we totally were going to disrupt that cycle and someone was going to hear this, it's like, if you feel like it's all falling apart, you can't stop it. I don't know how to slow down. I'm in pain. I can't, what would be the best way to go? Like, wake up, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like wh where would you go if not out the bus window? Well, I did, I did the right thing, even though it's also hard, which is I told my bandmates like, yo, I, you know, um, like, I think I want to kill myself. And so, you know, they, they pulled me out of the bus, they talked to me. And then I like had a breakdown and I straight up like ran away from them. And I ran into the woods 
and I would go up to this bridge in Belgium and I'm like, I'm going to think about jumping off of it. But honestly, what stopped me and it's fucked up, but it's true. What stopped me is that I, I thought it wasn't high enough and it would just break my legs. And I didn't want to live with that, you know? Um, and, and so I'm like sitting there thinking about that and it did actually, even just the thought, cause I, I knew in the back of my mind, it's like, dude, you've never tried any, any real medications for your anxiety. Like, you like you do all these rituals, you do all these things to try to like prepare your body and prepare your voice for tour. And you do all these crazy things and you're kind of superstitious, but like, why don't you just like, just try what they're saying? Cause what, like, what's the, at this point, like, what do you have to lose? Apparently nothing, you know, if you're willing to end your life. And so even knowing that the option to get help was there, that did help me. Um, and then also, uh, you know, there's some of the guilt stuff. I mean, you know, you, you think about the people that you love. Cause like, yeah. while I was not in my right mind at all, and I was like, my heart rate was probably pounding out of my chest. And like, um, I've seen about all sorts of dumb stuff. I mean, when the cops came to grab me, I, th- I like considered just shoving them and running. Like, that was like, that's really, really, really what I wanted to do. But like, there's still that rational part of my brain, the same part that says, hey, don't jump, you're just going to break your legs, you, you might not even get what you want, which is for everything to stop. And the part of in the rational part was still there. And there's just kind of this. Uh, but there's this mania, for sure, that was happening. Yeah, and, uh, like, you're still in that, like, I don't know how to stop. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it's so just you like, told, but you told your dudes. So like, you looked at friends or someone and said, I, I don't want to live anymore. And they, yeah. what they do, they tried to stop the wheel. And then it was like, you were actually able to kind of fall. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll never forget. They like, like we were out of the bus and they, they give me a hug. And for some reason, like, I just wasn't in a, in a right place to accept that hug. And I got like freaked out by like them holding me. And like, I think there's some paranoia there. Cause I'm like, oh, they're going to bring me to a, a place. But I mean, they just wanted to help me. But I, I remember I just shoved them off and I just ran. And like, I I remember I like one of them tried to grab me. I threw my phone at him. And like, I think looking back, it's kind of a profound thing. I I, like when I threw the phone, it was kind of this good and bad thing. Cause like the good thing was like, cause like this phone that was actually screwing me up. Like I was on social media way more than anyone should be. And I was like, not always talking, but just reading, just looking, you know, like, Uh. like, you know, who, who did Donald Trump insult today? I was just like, I, I was too tuned into it. Right. And, but it was also funny because throwing my phone was also scary for them because I think for them that also meant like, dude, like he's done. Like it was so, like, it, it became such an important part that you always had it, that that was like exactly. your place of power. Like that's yeah. his connection and he's dropping it. Oh my yeah, God. I mean like throwing the phone is the 21st century equivalent of like stripping naked, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because these things are like our keys to the world. And like, imagine, imagine if someone said, just come home and then they throw their keys at you. You know what I mean? And like, that's kind of what I was doing when I threw my phone. But, um, you know, I just, I, I spent like a whole month in the mental clinic, like crying and like screaming, like screaming my ass off and like into pillows and punching the bed because dropping off of the tour was, you know, the greatest failure of my life. I mean, one, you talk about like, we, you know, we went 50 grand in debt. I mean, it was was incredibly expensive to drop off of a Europe tour with a bus and you got to still pay that bus, but you're not making any money. You know, I mean, that was rough, dude. And then um, on top of that, you know, the whole world knows what you're going through. And I mean, it was just like this nightmare that I always prayed would never come, you know. And then and then when it came, I, I mean, I was freaked out, like really bad. So what... <clears throat> as a band, like with the, with the rest of the dudes in the group, where are you guys at now? Like, so the worst thing that ever could have happened professionally 
happened, right? Like, I mean, nearly one of you guys being dying would have been the worst, like, but like dropping professionally from such a big deal, horrible situation. What has been the fallout? And then tell me about what didn't go wrong. Because a lot of times in that, this is the worst thing ever. It's like, well, did everybody quit? Did they all leave? Is Silent Planet yeah, I mean, that, like, that, that's, the beautiful, that's the beautiful thing is that like my bandmates still love me and they still want to work with me. Like, I, I guess I expected them to, you know, still be nice to me. I, I obviously didn't think they'd get home and say, you know, fuck you. I hate you. But <laughs> I, I, I traumatized them, to be honest with you. Like they, That's a massive thing to go through. They, they were like, and my girlfriend was on that tour and I traumatized her. And, um, and like, I mean, I made them cry. Like I, I found out later, you know, I didn't know this, but the whole time I was missing for a couple hours, they were like bawling their eyes out because they thought that I was dead, you know, or dying. And that, um, that has, uh, has weighed on me, you know, no. um, because it's, it's like it's 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 easy for me to look back at you know the the where I was at and it, like that doesn't make me cry but thinking about them you know suffering um, and you know for the most part I'm kind of like a leader you know to, to these guys and in my band and to my girlfriend and so feeling like not only did the captain you know it's like the captain jumped off the ship kind of and uh, and. I, I, I love them so much. And, uh, you know, n- knowing that they still like want to tour with me, you know, um, really means a lot, you know, and, uh, I don't think that I would have got really serious professional help if it wasn't them saying, dude, will you please do that? And like, that would help us a lot, you know, um, because, you know, when I was at the place, you know, everyone's like, you know, why are you here? You know, and people are saying, you know, because I want to work on my marriage because I want to stop being an alcoholic because I want to stop being depressed because, you know, whatever. Um, but for me, the truth was like, I'm here because like I traumatized the hell out of people that I love. And um, one, I want them in the short term to just feel more like at ease. Yeah. But then two, in the long term, I, I, I want to become a better, I want to get better so that I don't ever put them through that again. You know what I mean? Wow. Yes, I do. And, and, and that, that's the main reason. And, and to be honest, you know, like, like I had a therapist say, you know, your priorities are kind of fucked up because like you're still just getting help to help other people. Other people. And, and that, that's something that I'm still working on because yeah. the truth is, yeah, my, myself my own self image and my own self worth is like pretty bad. Um, and, and I think that's going to take longer to work through, but in the short term, at least I'm working through anxiety, which is necessary because when you're anxious, I feel like everything else, like you can be anxious and 20 other things can be wrong with you, but until you deal with a shield of anxiety, you can't deal with anything else because your anxiety is just constantly just like boom, 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 boom. And like, you can't read a book literally or figuratively when you're like sprinting you know what i mean yeah and like my brain was just sprinting for so long that's profound man especially with the number of because like i hung out with jake um jakey lures like a couple months ago got to go out with him a little bit for a heart support thing and and he's just such a beautiful human and i just love him so we're just hanging out talking but like um it was like that trip. And then I got back and I listened to a podcast with, uh, rain Wilson, the dude from the office. Yeah. The office. Yeah. And he and yeah. his family have some new foundation. That's all about helping the younger generation of people on the planet because suicide ideation is like at an all time high. Oh dude. There's suicide this- and opioid addiction has like, it's dropped our, it's dropped our life expectancy. It's, I mean, it's just great. So I'm hearing this and just going like, man, people need to know that like that free, that buzz, that frequency in your inner man, that's just dry. That's not normal. Like if you feel way messed up, there's a good chance that you actually are. And there's a good chance that there's a lot of contributing factors, not the least of which is our day-to-day life for some reason has just gotten like, 
I don't know what, man, but it just feels like a fuel for anxiety. So I think there's so many people that are struggling and, and they're trying to like keep it at bay or like get through the day or just for the love of God. Like if I can just get to here, maybe it'll come down. And I think the idea of going, no, like listen to your body, listen to your mind. Like, yeah. think about it. Like if you're looking at a little kid and that little kid tells you what you're telling you, yeah. good or bad, like, well, because we, we, we create all these, we, I think so many people are unknowingly creating all these excuses to why they can't stop doing the things that make them anxious. Like, 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 like I was like, I was like, I can't stop being on social media 24 seven. Cause it's, 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 it's growing my business. It's growing my band. And I look around, you know, Thomas has a house and a wife, you know, and Alex like helps take care of his family you know, and, and Mitch has all these cool aspirations in, in an apartment in Burbank, which is expensive. And so I'm looking at these guys and I'm like, and I'm lying to myself. I'm saying, dude, like you're doing this to grow your band to help these people. But it, dude, it's bullshit. Like there's so many other ways that you can grow and stuff that doesn't require you to be on social media and be texting all the time. And like, when's the last time you wrote when you read a motherfucking book, dude? Like, <laughs> It's been a long time. Oh, and man. And you're like an academic. Guy. You're a well, smart guy. Like, if you're a book guy. Like, literally, like, I'm known as, like, the metalcore book guy. I'm known as, like, the dude from metalcore that reads a lot and, like, like has opinions on things, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, I can't, I can't do that. And, like I, like, I tell people to go to therapy. I'm not going to. I'm not seeing a therapist. I can't tell you how many kids I've lied to. They said, do you do go to therapy? I'm like, yeah, I do. And I told myself, one, like, oh, well, you're going to go to therapy after this tour is over. So it's, it's, no, not yeah, you, I mean, I'm connected. I can just call so and so. Yeah, yeah I can just call so and so. Yeah. Like, I know a lot of therapists. Wow. You know? I know what a therapist would say. But like, like, I'm, 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 I'm being like a politician. I'm lying to people. Mm. And it, and it sucks. It's <sighs> bullshit. Cause like, like, I, I hate politicians. I mean, everyone hates the whole politician thing. But like, I've become that I've become a representation of the person that I want to be that I want people to think I am. But I'm not being that person. Really you're not you're not able to be in integrity there. No. Holy smokes, man. It's like all the pastors that are addicted to pornography, you know, yeah. and they say like, they talk about sexual sin, but like, they, they, they're struggling with it. <sighs> I, I'm not here to say that those pastors are evil, stupid people. I'm just here to say like, I can identify with that. And yeah, yeah I've, I've been that guy. Honestly, I have grace for all the two-faced people because my anxiety was making me two-faced. And then when you realize you're two-faced, you just get more anxious if you don't deal with it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's epic. And, 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 and dude, I mean, it, it got crazy. I, got, I had this obsessive disorder, um, which I still do to some degree with my boys. It was really nefarious. Um, because I, I, I basically, I blew out my vocal, I blew out my voice in like uh, earlier in like October uh, when we were doing Japan in Australia. And um, so like these doctors are, dude, your voice is screwed up, blah, 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 all this stuff. I saw pictures of my vocal cords. They look super screwed up. And um, so it led me to this obsession where like I couldn't talk to people and focus on the conversation because I was hearing my voice. Oh, and that yeah, was yeah. weird. Because like, okay, like think about it. if you blow out your knee and you're a football player, it sucks for sure. But at least you can talk about it without like my, like my equivalent was a football player that blows out their knee, but anyone, anytime they want to express what they're thinking, they have to do this, you know, with their knee. Like, and that's what it felt like. it's like, I'm trying to tell you how bad this is. And every time I hit it, I'm aware yes. of every single thing that's wrong with it. Exactly. Oh. And it gets to the point where you get so isolated because you're like, well, if I talk, my voice won't recover. But then if I don't talk, I'm going crazy. So now I'll talk. But now the, the talking's not even doing anything because I can't even like express my feelings. I can't connect because I'm still stuck. Exactly. Holy smokes. Okay. All right. And so, and then, you know, what's funny, um, what helped me a lot actually was, uh, you know, Melissa Cross, she's like the scream mom. I never met her. She was on that tour. She came and said hi to you. And I fangirled and I turned around and went, oh, yeah. I want to call her. Cause I changed the way I screamed when Eric and JR left yeah. Giant. I changed my vocal thing. Cause I wanted it to be different. 
so as not to dishonor what we were, but it was yeah. not good for me. And I think it really hurt my voice. But I, so I kept thinking like, I should probably talk to her. I don't know. Well, Anyways, and it's so, funny because she, she helped me on, she helped me on a, on a mental level um, because, and she's the kind of person that like, if she talked about what she thought about the universe, she would like offend all Christians. Cause sure. she's like, she's like the ultra, like, like spiritualist person that just like, sure. you know, like yeah. but like she helped me a lot about just like realizing what I what it meant to be a human again and then it's so funny because as you know she wow. calls her dvds the zen of screaming yeah and i always just used to think that that was i used to always just think that that was like a clever title like a head nod to something yeah but she's actually like super serious about it to the point where like the way she teaches screaming is to like actually physically come from a place of meditation. And so like every morning now I do my warm ups and it's me and it's basically this like chanting thing that happens like in your head. Mm. And like and then the scream came from there. So now instead of having you go, oh like when I when I don't have, like for me now I can whoa, 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 whoa. like I can just scream like just it, it comes from this like other it's spot from this like sort of meditative state it's it's hard to explain but it's uh that's super and, cool and it's crazy i mean because she saved the careers of like the dude from lamb of god the dude from disturbed you know um she, the dude the dude of course uh cory taylor from slipknot all these people uh, yeah um and it's so funny because she just like she had to just show me like what it looks like to let go and so we're going to do our first tour uh, pretty soon coming up. It's a headliner. And it's crazy. Wow. Like almost all the shows have sold out, which is nuts for us. Of course. But of course. Um, we, we have this thing coming up and like, I'm not nervous to be on stage anymore because like, I just don't give a shit. Well, and it's funny because I, th- I remember, I remember, you know, like you were changing up your voice, but I remember watching you in 2014 and I could tell you didn't really care all that much about what people thought about how you sounded. You just wanted to like express what God was doing in your life. You want to express emotion. You wanted to talk about real shit. You wanted to connect to people. And I think that I can finally get back to that place where like, I won't care too much about like what, what I sound like. I, it's just going to be about like the relationships again. And that's how it was when I started. But when I started, um, you know, we were playing 20 minute sets and I was like, I was just doing whatever, but you get older and your body starts saying, ouch, you know, totally. And, 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 and so, like, I wasn't transitioning very well. I was just getting obsessed over all the things that were wrong with me. And it's still going to be a process. Holy I, I, I already, Say I, it again. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Say it again. I wasn't transitioning well. I just began obsessing. What well, You began obsessing over all the things that were going wrong. Exactly. That's all I could see. And, and like, you know what's funny? The, 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 the night, because we played our second show of that Europe tour in Paris. And these kids had flown all the way from Israel to, 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 watch, to, to watch the show, primarily for us. Because um, we, we have a song that's about conflict in the Middle East. And the last <laughs> lyric of the song, I say, Inshallah Shalom, which is, you know, uh, you know Inshallah, you, you know, is, in, is what Muslims say. They say, you know, be, be it the God's will, you know, or let it be so. And then Shalom, you know, peace. Yeah. And so I say, Inshallah Shalom. Um, and it's crazy because these Jewish kids came because I've, I've always I've actually met a lot of Arabic people that have expressed what that meant to them. But these were the first actually people from Israel yeah. to come and say that to me. And it's crazy because like they're like, dude, you have no idea what, what your music means to me. And like one of them, I think, is interested in Jesus now because of that. And so I'm hugging him and I'm crying. And it's this awesome thing. And, and then, of course, <laughs> anxiety instead of taking like, oh, what a beautiful thing takes oh my god those kids came all the way to see you were you good enough you got it you can't lose your voice because you have more shows what about all the other people that are traveling to see you come on it's crazy how instead of being like thank god for that moment so quickly it became a satanic obsession like something selfish something about you something yeah like, holy smokes okay like so having this god moment with these people right yeah like a profound like a divine moment. like a that divine thing is happening about. And, and then I get back on the yeah. bus and I try to go to bed and I'm literally shaking and I'm twitching. And at some point the anxiety gets so bad that I hear voices. Wow. I heard stuff. 
it, it, to be honest, it didn't make sense. It wasn't saying, you know, Garrett, go, go kill a cat. It was just kind of like, it was just kind of like, I would hear like whispers, like one, I heard Garrett, like I just kept hearing like stuff. And like, I was like, like, I, I know, I know some Christians might say, oh, it was demons, you know, you know, like freaking you out. I, I, and I don't know, like, I'm, I, I, you know me, I'm kind let's of, go, like, let's I'm go 50, 50 mentally. What do you think that is? Do you think that's your body, your brain finally just going like, it's not firing. Like I'm not computing in a hell. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's, the, I think it's, it's, you're reaching a point of overload, well, you know, like, like, like you're, like you're, you, 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 you like your stress threshold is and you, you're just like, you've spent so long just going through walls and finally like you've reached the last wall that you can't break through. Um, but, but, and, 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 and I've never, and I'm, I'm not the person to say, well, that can't, you know, that's God. That's not God. That's, that's the devil. That's not the devil. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. God's in everything. And I do believe that there's an enemy. And I think that enemy was so stoked on my anxiety. Totally. You know? Yeah. Um, but so, so sometimes I do get a little afraid because, because I'm here in Redding, California. I grew up in Redding, California. Mm-hmm. And of course, Redding's known for Bethel um, Church. Yeah. And so I, I do get a little nervous sometimes because I do know some people that could benefit from medications that think, no, I just need to have more faith. And um, I, yeah, I, I hear that. And I think it's the, um, there's a sense in me that I go, okay, well, let's put Christian language on. It's like first in the natural and then in the spirit. Like, why don't you look at yourself as like a holistic thing? People don't like that language though. They get real weird about that. Like they, they that do. somehow God isn't a part of that is very interesting to me. Well, yeah, because I, I've always thought like, why isn't everything supernatural? Because, because like the, like whether or not we evolved from apes and we're here and God used evolution, or whether or not whether or not we were created in a literal six seven days, like so many people debate that stuff. And um, but I've come to this conclusion: it's like, dude, what matters is the story that God loves us and that God created us and that we're made in the image of God. You know, I mean, think, think about think about how many people were made from dirty, nasty, meaningless, like hookup sex. Like th- those people, those people came from something that was like very just like stupid and meaningless. But they are so meaningful. Yeah, fact. you know. And so, like, it's it's so like I look at so many people saying, "Oh, that's natural. That's not natural. Whatever." I'm like, dude, like if God made it and God made everything, it's all supernatural. Yeah. It all has, then, it's all been touched in some way. Yeah. Well, and the it, Bible it, would say it too. It's like in him, in God, we live, move and have our being. Like there's nowhere to go where there's not the, the, like this far away, like the veil is so thin that you can just touch divine moments, like anywhere. If you look at it like that, then anything can be a gift from God. Yeah. Like, constantly trying to like yeah. fight it all. So where's your life? Like, what? Oh, that's good. That's not like, that's just, that seems insane so, to me, but it's okay. Yeah. You, you, you're going to track with me on this because I've been straight edge pretty much my whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was 27, I tried marijuana a couple times to see if it helped with my anxiety. It did. It, it made it worse. Um, <laughs> and, but but I've, I've been like straight edge my whole life, right? And so um, when I'm at this place, they give me gabapentin. So gabapentin is the medication that I'm on. And um what what it does basically is it opens it, it, it like it basically makes your, your GABA receptors work, which is part of the chain of like of of how um, serotonin and dopamine work. So, anyways, all that to say, I started taking this drug, and the first time I took it, um, it got me pretty high um, because oh. my body hadn't acclimated to it. Oh my! God. Um, and it's funny because it's like like uh, it, it's of course this drug is meant to be taken long term. But yeah. the first time you take it, it might actually get you high. So sure enough, I was feeling like like just really whatever. And this crazy thing happened when when I when I took this. I, I remember I, I walked outside of um of the of the I was in like a we had like all these mandatory classes. So I, I walked out like like it was pouring rain and it was thundering. And I could tell like, you know, a lot of people were kind of anxious about it. But this thing like popped me open. And so I go outside, like, and everyone's probably staring at me, but I literally just took off my shirt. You're just a burning man, bro. You're just chilling, bro. This well, is- and I'm just feeling the rain. And I like literally started crying because I had this epiphany. I'm like, I can't believe I wanted to kill myself when there's a world this beautiful. Wow. Like, like I was so obsessed with my voice and everything that I was in beautiful ass Belgium 
and I couldn't enjoy any of it. I wanted to jump off this beautiful bridge instead of just admire this like beautiful world. Yeah. And I, I and yes, I know that, yeah, like that came from being high. And I'm not saying to people go get high to have spiritual revelations, but what I, the, what this drug did for me for a bit is because anxiety basically makes the ego, the self, the thing that you think Tommy is, yeah. it basically makes that thing so loud that you don't hear anything else. The, the, the anxiety anxiety made the, the inner Garrett so loud. He's like, help, 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 that he could never just excuse my language, but shut the fuck up to like experience basic physical sensations that are beautiful, like mm. the rain falling on your skin. Breath, light. Breath, light. Action, like things that are good from God. People are like, wow. God, where are you? It's like, God's literally in like, is, I'm not saying God is all of that, but the imprint of God is in all of this. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, do I believe that, like, like and I'm not saying, yeah, the, the answer isn't, oh, you know, just just love nature. But what I'm saying is anxiety can block off all the beautiful things, not just nature, but relationships or like, wow. or like food that you like. Like, like, and like anything that like, that God has put on this earth to be enjoyed like you can't enjoy it when like the inner ego is just screaming. And of course, what does Jesus say? You know, Jesus says like, crucify yourself and follow me. I think a lot of times people like think like, okay, you know, I need to stop watching porn and I need to read my Bible. No, it's, it's, it's more than just that. It's like crucify all of your, like all your fears, all of your like ambitions. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the stuff that the, the stuff that the ego says, you're all about that. You know, crucify, you're like, my church has to grow to this much. Like, all that Come stuff on. has to die. Yeah, bro. Yeah. It, it, it's, not just, it's not just like the sinful stuff. It's the entire ego because, and, 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 you know, all major world religions are basically saying like, you know, the ego is in the way. The difference is with Christianity, not only do we get to like maybe experience God, we get to actually participate in that and we get a new identity. And, 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 you know, because like, say, say Buddhism is, teaches you a lot about how to deny the self and it and has a lot of like, you know, I, people might get mad at me, but there's a lot of good wisdom there. Totally. However, so I much you stop short of the, the power of like, actually just like, have like walking with the Holy Spirit in you. Like and a new nature, a new nature, a new nature right now. Exactly. The virtue of that yeah. spirit being yeah. within you. Wow. Okay. Because, because. Because there's a lot of screwed up stuff in this world. And I'm definitely not saying, you know, just block out all the self and absorb everything. It's like, there's a lot of stuff you don't want to absorb. But dude, if you can deny yourself enough to not just like pray to God, but actually experience God, like that is, that's living in power. I was thinking about, I, I met with this dude out here, Garrett, is, is, and I'm going to probably try to have him on. He's a He's a therapist out here and he yeah. deals with, he deals with trauma. stuff. I, I met with him because the modality yeah. of trauma therapy I did, I wanted to verify that I, I it wasn't like weird because it was so powerful for me. And sure enough, he talked about how there's like talk therapy and there's different modalities within trauma. And um, one of the things he said though, but he, he's a Christian, you know? And so it doesn't, he doesn't, it's his clinical work is not connected to, you know, faith based stuff or anything, but we were just talking because he's a friend of a friend of ours from our church. And so he's like, my favorite book in the Bible is Ecclesiastes. And I said, why? And he said, because I knew that nothing mattered. But what's beautiful about that is we get to create our own meaning. We, we create the meaning of our life. Like we have this dynamic ability to say, it doesn't matter. Like it really, it really doesn't. Yeah. But it can like it's so cool so we just talked like an hour and just shared about trauma and and you know making sure that people have their other needs met before you go addressing some pretty profound traumatic stuff and you know you, anyway so it was just a really dynamic conversation but i think about what you're saying a little bit and saying like hey my homie julio he's like a brother and and he's a crew in in redlands and um big part of like the Tithemi crew and like all of our friends out there and just a, a total boss. And one of the things he said when we wrote, when Sleeping Giant wrote the song, uh, The Cross is Suicide, he said, I feel like all these young kids, like you're just saying, um, 
we're already dead. But these kids, it's like, they already know it. And I think there's a real sense of like, we know how futile so much of this can be. And we know that the ego and like this attachment and all the stuff we try to create, it really doesn't satisfy. But like, who's going to build the bridge from like nothingness to meaning? And that's why I think the Holy Spirit is such a genius because we, we get to co-create lives of meaning when ultimately there's 8 billion people I'll never yeah. meet. And yeah. like, they, they could die tomorrow and I'll never know their name. And yet somehow in God's orchestration, every single one of them has value. Like you said, all the throwaway kids, all the hookup kids, all those, like they have immense value and worth. They're priceless to God. And it's because he assigns that meaning in a world of kind of meaninglessness yeah. in a lot of ways. Exactly. So that's exactly. powerful, bro. Well, like Genesis 40, 20, right? Like what you intended to harm me, God intended for good, you know? And there's, there's so much, it, it kind of brings me back to like, it's like, it's like Christmas, right? Like, like, it's so funny because sometimes I see Christians get hung up on like, that thing comes from pagan ideology. I'm like, dude, Christmas comes from, pa like, Christmas was like a pagan winter thing. <laughs> and then like, and then Christians are like, yo, let, let's instill that with like, with like, with like the story of Jesus. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it's so funny because I, I saw I, the other day, I saw like a hyper conservative person talking about the Enneagram and saying like, don't, don't read that. Like it comes from pagan roots or something. And like, I will admit, it's kind of mean of me. And I think they got pissed and they blocked me because I just said like, yo, like you're on some fundamentalist shit right now, brother. You know? And they didn't want to hear that. But like, yo, I, I, I want to make a, something, something you said is interesting. So Ecclesiastes, realizing yeah. that, that, you know, things don't have life. Doesn't it's really just vanity happen. is vanity, you know, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Yeah. Like that. So yeah. You've heard of existentialism, right? The, the, idea, yeah. the idea that like, 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 it's all kind of subjective and that like, Truth is more a question of perception than it is of reality. So the funny thing that people never talk about when they talk about existentialism, which we're living in an existential age, like yeah, that's um, real. And the funny thing is, people always talk about Nietzsche, right? They're, they talk about Sartre, or they talk about Camus, they talk about Heidegger, they talk about all these. But the funny thing is, the the person like that it all comes from. Without this person, we don't get these thoughts. Is Soren Kierkegaard. So, you know, and, and as you yeah, yeah. know, this dude is, um, he's a, he's a Christian. I mean, he that's, wrote, that's like, what I thought. I'm like, I thought Soren yeah. Kierkegaard was like, he loves God, doesn't he? Like, oh, yeah, he wrote, he wrote works of love, which is a beautiful, like if, if anyone, like in anyone like you who does church stuff, read works of love. Cause this is a book written in, in, in the 1800s about what it means to practice neighbor love in, in, in like a community. But like, so the dude wrote theology books, but then, uh, you know, his philosophy, existentialism, that comes out of, you know, the, the, the um, postscripts uh, and, uh, and uh, fear and trembling in those books, which are kind of more philosophical in nature. But like, we, like, he's the grandfather of existentialism. And it's so funny because this, this, this question of like meaning and stuff that, you know, people always talk about existentialism as kind of a, um, as a, like a, sort of alternative alternative view to like what faith is it's like no dude it, it comes from faith it comes from Kierkegaard who mm -hmm. is profoundly impacted by the life of Jesus you know it's yeah. crazy no that's awesome because I just think in general I like the way that you said it um and I agree with you it seems like so much is like on the table that we really are like this is a, it truly it's an existent it's an existential season in mass it's crazy to mm -hmm. see what is all back on the table? Like everything's back on the table again. Everything's up for discussion. And Chris Rock said there's like math and then everything else is negotiable. And I feel like we're in a spot where even math seems to be like negotiable. Like we're like, yeah, ah. we're, we're, like we're, we're living in an age and this isn't to get political, but it's, it's you at all. I think it'd be, it'd be silly to not point out like, look, we're living in the Trump era, right? Mm -hmm. And so Trump, um, you know, Trump, Trump will say, you know, windmills give you cancer you know and, and 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 he'll say he'll say things that like everyone kind of knows is a lie even his supporters kind of chuckle at it you know what i mean and and so we're, we're kind of living in an age where we're really asking ourselves like what is truth is truth just like whatever like it, like, like 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 is it is it's truth this this thing that we just participate in when we want to is it this thing that just works for us it's truth you know not even about what is said but who says it and like we're 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 dealing in this, we're in this really interesting era 
kind of teetering on nihilism where it's just like um and and um and that's why unfortunately you know you, you do see a lot of i mean you see like hate groups even like you see like white supremacy getting more popular <laughs> people are just doing any looking for meaning anywhere that's- and so the church has such an opportunity to say like dude we're more than a thing you attend on sundays like we're a mission like we're a life statement oh, we're like a we're we're a revolution you know and that's why you call it revolution reality and like and it's funny because I think that you're the reason why I say this, but people often ask, like, like you know, what, what, why are you religious, whatever? I'm like, dude, like, people used to say, you know, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. I'm more like, it's not a religion, it's a revolution. Yeah, it's subversive. It will always be deeply indestructible, subversive. full culture, counter everything. And that's the thing. Exactly. <laughs> whether, whether politicians want to kill you for it or whether politicians want to fake be it, it's Come on. subversive. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, and they won't be able to, and they can't own it and they'll never be able to sell it and they can't, oh, yeah. they can't contain it. No one can. That's the beauty yeah. of Jesus. He's the best. Dang it. No, totally. Oh when it's gosh. so funny. Cause like, I've even heard people say like, watch out, you know, this guy or this guy or say like Bernie Sanders, like he might run, he'll be the first candidate ever to run who says he's not a Christian. Um, and I, and they're like, are you concerned that we're like losing? Like, and I'm like, no, like I'm excited. because <laughs> like, I'm like, being like, honest. Most of them just say they are and they're not. <laughs> Clinton or Obama or Trump. These people are just co-opting this thing but there aren't like i don't think these people are down for the revolution just to be no. honest with you and like i'm not i'm not judging like their personal faith but what i'm saying is like you know for a long time americans have tried to co-opt the faith and europeans walked away from it but regardless like it, it's always subversive whether you live yeah. in a place whether you live in a place that tries to co-opt it or whether you live in a place that laughs at it you know or whether you live in a place in the middle east that kills you for it yeah yeah it's still the small little seed that is going to become the largest tree in the garden because it's people. It's not about it's not yeah. about other stuff. Well, and it's, it's, the, it's the mustard seed revolution, right? That's like it. like mustard seeds, just these tiny little things, and they're ugly, but they they spread. <laughs> He's so smart. Jesus of Nazareth is a prophet. He is real deal. Um, that's so wild. Okay, so let me bring this in. Then in in the same. So this is what I'm gonna do. So it seems like for most of these so far. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask one, I'll ask one thing. Actually, this is what I'll do. What's something that all the Rev kids or anyone that's going to hear this podcast yeah. that has, that has a heart in your direction that could have belief for you. What can we be believing for with you in this next year? That's a great question. I think, uh, I think you can be believing that God can use deeply, deeply, deeply flawed people like me and like maybe people like listening to this podcast that are like, you know, like that, like for a long time, I was like, I I felt like I'm like, I'm like the, I'm like the expert in mental health, like in my little pocket of society and stuff. And then it's like, you're staying on a bridge in Belgium, like screaming into the abyss, ready to jump off of it. And, and you're like, man, like I, like I am deeply, deeply flawed and broken. And some of, I think what made my, like fueled my anxiety and my inability to be still was like, cause you're going to have to look at it. Like the people that pray that just talk to God, talk, 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 talk. They don't have to deal with a lot of like the real stuff, Yeah. but the people that are the monks <laughs> The people that, that are, you know, that, that are being quiet and just listening and waiting on the voice of God, like are extremely vulnerable and they are, they are shitting naked in front of, in front of God, you know, like, like it it is, you're so vulnerable, you know, Um, and getting to where I can do that. And it's, it's, I mean, it's still difficult for me and I'm on 900 milligrams of gabapentin a day. Yeah. And I'm on Wellbutrin for, for, for depression and for, and for, and I, I'm taking these medications and it's still difficult for me. But before I took these medications, it was like almost neurologically impossible. <laughs> because, but and once again, though, I, it's, I, in some, some people, of course, you know, they, they'll get depression and stuff and it's not their fault. They just have, 
some some rough brain chemistry that puts them there. But I can say truly, my anxiety and my depression could have been avoided if, if I would have oriented my life in better ways and structured it. And and honestly, like say, yo, it's cool that you bounce from place to place. But how about you live this in one place for for a month? Because because it's actually landing as it's landing as trauma. In your exactly. Life, whether you exactly. like it or not. Well, and, and so that's the thing. I was at this mental hospital and I was freaking out. And it's so funny because every everyone else at this mental hospital, it's like more of a clinic was like, dude, isn't it great? Like we're just here for a month, no work stress, no relationship stress, eating, eating at the same place every day. And I was freaking out. I'm like, yo, this is the most confined I've been since I was 17, 16 years old, whatever, forced to live in my hometown. Like I've lived my whole life, especially when tour happened. I always thought personal growth equals physical move. You know what I mean? Like I'm not growing if I'm not on a plane, if I'm not like, if I'm not on a stage, if I'm not moving, 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 moving. And that's such bullshit. And that's narcissism and that's ego at its, at its core. Cause it says, yo, you can like, you can be like God, these things, these phones tell us we can be like God. Right. Because Adam and Eve wanted to be like God and we still want to be like God. The difference is we can trick ourselves with our eyes. Now you, I, I can be talking to you and, and I can scroll over a tab and I can be having a conversation in New York city. Then I can open up Instagram and I can be in a jungle, um, you know, in South America. Like, totally, yeah, yeah. I can be omniscient and I can be omnipresent because yeah. the internet, because the internet makes me so. Because I like, think about it, humans have not existed for that long, whether you believe in evolution or not, it doesn't matter. Humans have not existed for that long. But the thing is, technology is like, poof, you know what I mean? Like you look at like, say, like, 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 like you look at your, you know, you look at your, your, your thumbnail. Yeah. And you say that is technology from like the time of Jesus to the 1900s. And then you look at your whole body and that's technology from 1950 to now. Yeah. It's exponential. Like, it's so it's insane. Exponential. But the things is we are we're still we still have the brains of our ancestors. We still have lizard brains, you guys. We're still in full on survival mode, waiting for a saber tooth tiger, and we don't know how to handle all of this. Dude, most people <clears throat> that are listening to this podcast don't even know how to breathe correctly. Mm. How crazy is that? Like, think <laughs> about that shit for a second. Like, what is the one thing that you do that you do the most is breathe? Yeah. Like most people know how to like operate technical machinery and like there's probably people listening to this that know how to code computers and fix cars and do all this highly technical stuff you know but they don't even know how to breathe with their with their diaphragm (laughs) you know yo it's crazy i i i knew a girl in grad school who she was also saying to be a therapist but um we like had a class on breathing and it changed her life she was like oh my god like like she was so anxious for so many years and it was just because she wasn't like getting enough oxygen correctly. She's in panic mode. She's in oh, panic mode. Folks. Crazy. <sighs> Dang, man. All right, well, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you right now. Yeah. Thank you. And then, and then I want you to tell people how to, how to, um, leave you alone or find you online. So, um, God, I pray for Gary right now. And I, I just pray, I'm so thankful, Lord, that I'm thankful for his mind, and I'm thankful for his brain, and I'm thankful for his body chemistry, and I'm thankful that in the midst of absolute panic, he's still, you are still able to, like, use that fantastic computer in his brain to logically say, how about no, maybe not, what about them? Thank you, God, for our emotions. Thank you for our brains. Thank you for our body chemistry. Thank you for each other. Um, And God, I pray right now for Garrett that he would find a home um, in you and he would actually find a home for himself that would actually anchor him in ways that are the best for him. That he would be, um, that his home would be like a bow and he can be like the arrow, but like give him a spot. And help him to settle in to your presence and to silence and to um, give him the space and time. And this is what I feel for you is like, 
I want God to give you the time where you can break down why your breakdown was the best thing that ever happened for you and him and what that's going to do. I, I guess I just pray that God, you would, you, you picked up every broken piece. You picked up every broken piece and you gathered them all up. And so whatever in this, in the last year for Garrett's story was, a, was broken pieces. I thank you, God, that you gather them all up and not one of them is lost. And so God, thank you for Garrett's life. Thank you for Silent Planet. Thank you for their sound. Thank you for their friendships. Thank you for the community that rallies to them um, because they are singing their song. Like you're, they're, they're playing the sound that's within the hearts of a lot of people. And so, God, I pray that you would make um, the songs and this, this thing, this next season of Silent Planet, I pray that you'd make it like medicine for, for wounds all over the world. But, God, I pray for Garrett that, that you would give him a joyful heart and you would, you'd help him to, to not reset to where he was, but, God, to come to like a new place of real deep and profound peace. And that um, when ego pops up or the performer or the fraud or whatever that is that shoots up in his life, that you'd actually help him navigate those waters um, because he serves. He serves so many people in such a unique way. So, God, I'm thankful for my friend. I'm thankful for my brother. And I, I just pray, God, that you bless him and protect his life. Thank you for his family. Thank you for all the dudes. Thank you for um, even just this short moment that we've had together. And I pray right now for anyone that's going to hear this. Um, I don't know, but God, Garrett, Garrett has experience here and he's also got a lot of understanding in this way. And so I pray right now for anyone that's even heard his story, that God, you'd, you'd extend like length of days towards them, that that death would not be the answer for them, but that healing and health and connection and love would be the answer for them. And and they would stay alive, that they would stay alive long enough to watch you take it full circle, God. And so I just pray for miracles to happen because of um, the testimony that, that Garrett just shared as a witness. Um, and so, God, please just please protect people's lives, save people's lives, God. And, and thank you so much for Garrett. I just bless him. And I just I, I pray, God, that you would actually like encounter him in beautiful ways as his body and his mind come into a whole new state of being. Um, I just pray that you continue to encounter him and give him new miracles for this new season and give him new understanding. And uh, we just bless him in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Yeah. I want to join you on that. Jesus. Uh, Yo. Thank you so much for the children <laughs> that are listening to this because even though they've probably uh, convinced themselves that they're not children, they're your children. Mm -hmm. And um uh, I pray you'd help us all learn how to uh, approach you like children. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, for, for this ministry. I'm so thankful for Tommy and for, for Chrissy and for their witness uh, as they've gone through immense, immense, immense suffering. And um, that you're using a pain that may never fully make sense, but you're using it anyways. And, uh, and that, that, that child is testifying through this and through Tommy and through Chrissy. Uh, thank you for the fullness of your spirit. Thank you that, uh, that you found me when I was fucked up and broke them in Belgium and that, that you found Tommy and Chrissy uh, holding the most in, the most incredible grief that they've ever known and that you could find someone listening to this podcast right now who is on the edge and they might not even know they're on the edge, but they're, they're there. But that what they think is just a dark abyss is just a tiny little pothole to you. And you can, you can work through that and you can move them through that. So thank you, father. We, we accept you uh, continuously into our lives we uh, thank you so much for using us despite our brokenness. Inshallah, shalom. Amen. I love you, buddy. I love you too. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. So, okay. How, <clears throat> I don't want people to punish you. And I also know that it sounds like there's over systems overload can happen online. But if people wanted to know where's Silent Planet going to be, how do they, how do they find you? What do they do? 
If you're listening to this and it's uh, still February or March of 2020, you should come watch my band on tour because it's going to be fun. <laughs> so that's the next thing we got going on is we're, we're doing our uh, headliner tour, taking out some some cool bands. Very, very kind of heavy uh, tour. Should be fun. And then... Uh, and then, um, yeah, you can always tweet at me, and I apologize in advance because I'm probably saying some offensive stuff on Twitter. You know, I had the realization the other day because I'm turning 30 uh, on this upcoming tour, and I'm like, I I should probably grow up a little bit, you know, on the internet. I should like, or I was thinking like too, like if I ever wanted to get a grown up job, especially if I was ever working ministry, it would be like, dude, you got to delete that stuff. You have to like clear your timeline, bro. Yeah. And like to be fair, like I I can I can firmly say. I'm never on there like cursing. I'm I'm not I'm not cursing people. I'm not being hateful, but 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 short of being hateful, I'm just being completely stupid. You know? <laughs> and so like I I have but anyways, you can always hit me up on stuff. I think Twitter's unfortunately what I'm on the most. Maybe that'll change. But I but I um I you know I I, I love it when people come out to shows. Not just because we desperately need people to come to shows, but because like that's where the real conversations happen. Yeah, you know? that's good. And, and I always I always try to tell people, like, if you ever try to get in touch with me and I fail, I apologize. But there, the door is always open when we're playing yeah. shows. For me, touring, touring at its best when I'm in a mentally good place is is really just like a series of conversations with friends, you know. And, and, and I, as you know, the music in metal and hardcore is is and should be always secondary to, to the community and to the conversations. You know what I mean? Um yeah. That's, that's definitely something that you taught me like straight up. I you taught me that without saying it, Mm because I watched Sleeping Giant in 2008 at Cornerstone at the face down tent. And I was just like, like, I always I always connected with more like the shreddy crazy music. And so I'm like, yeah, like, I don't know, this music's fine. It's it's not my thing. But like, (laughs) I I could tell you didn't give it. It's like, that's, that's not, it's just not what it was about for you. Dude. Like it, it was about the relationships. And I saw that in your life. And, and um, thanks, Garrett. And I, I don't know, man. I like you and I are both kind of crazy, you know, people like we're all over the place, you know, yeah. but uh, so, something else that really impacted me is when we toured with you is there was no, there was no pretension at all. all almost every other band I've toured with, they can be cool people, but they definitely like they're aware that like they're the headliner and you're like the opener. <laughs> so it was so clear to me touring with you that you really didn't care like about like who's who, what's what, what band's popular, who gets likes on whatever. Like that just was so like and and the, the third thing and I I'm, I'm not trying to like put you on pedestal, but you uh, laughed so much and, and it was like this laughter. <laughs> That's like in your spirit uh, that like I connected with because I've never been like a super, super serious person. Yeah. Um, And it was cool and affirming to know like, well, there's this dude out there that everyone tells me is doing good ministry, but that guy is like a total wise ass, you know, and and it's cool to know that that's okay. Like, it's okay to have a spirit of like laughter and of joy. Come on, man. I don't know how you're going to survive if you don't. Also, I'm Irish, so like, you know, what are you gonna do? It's like it's part of, well, and, and, yeah. part of my people, you know. Well, that's the thing is, like, I had this like pessimist brain, and the way I can counter it is just by joking. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's because my brain's always like, well, that's gonna fail. That's gonna suck. That's gonna blow up. That's gonna turn into a war. That's like, what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, so what else are you gonna like, do? Like you're gonna suck that show. So like the best thing I can do to counter that is just laugh about it. Yeah. And say like, dude, I'm in a metal band. Who cares? Like I'm screaming, just go ah! Like stop <laughs> worrying about it. You know what I mean? Come on, man. Holy but then that's what's cool about like Melissa Cross taught me how to get on stage, and instead of having to go ah, I could just whoa, 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 whoa. Just do that all night. It is so fun and it's easy. Wow. It's crazy. That's yeah. awesome. Oh my and it's, it's 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 the zen of screaming. It's the thought like I don't have to I don't have to push 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 to create sound. I can actually just let sound like flow through me. You know what I mean? That's sick. Cause like you look at really good singers, dude, and it's effortless. Like you look at the best singers in the world and like they're effortlessly creating phenomenal sounds. Yeah. But yeah. like I'm, they're doing it just the <clears throat> same as I would pick up this cup of water and drink it. Yeah. 
Wow. It's not like, it's not like I got to breathe, right? I got to enunciate. I got to do this. Like, it's not this like chain of stuff. It's just this like flow, you know? And that's why Melissa Cross, she took all my warm ups that I was doing and she like threw them in the trash and she was like, just do this. Me, ah, one, two, nine. And she just like, just find this like comfort spot and like, just let the sound flow through. It blew my mind. Anyways. Yeah. Oh, that's so sick crazy oh my gosh okay well i love you thank you for being i love you too and i will talk to you soon and thank i can't you. wait and we love you okay bye hey bye <laughs> Hey, you guys, Tommy Green here. Just want to say thank you again for listening to this episode of the Rev Talks podcast. Our hope with each and every episode is that it would encourage you, maybe give you a reason to have a laugh, expand your capacity on the inside to love and empathy, appreciation, hopefully make your world just a little bit bigger and uh, give you faith, hope for the future. If you like what you heard, again, please share, subscribe, give us a good rating, give us some good feedback. Over all of this, thank you so much for taking us with you uh, in a small part of your day, on the drive, on, on the run, you know, just as you're going about your day. Thank you so much for sharing uh, some time of your life with us on this podcast. Um, to connect with us, you can email us again at therevgatherings.com and we will see you on the next episode. Love you guys. Bye.